If you're able, I'd ask you to please rise. Welcome in the name of Jesus, who is the Savior of the world. We're gathered here this morning to worship, to boldly proclaim Jesus Christ crucified and risen, and to remember before God our brother John Showalter, to give thanks for his life, to commend him to our merciful Redeemer, and to comfort one another in our grief. I'd ask you now to turn in your hymnals to hymn number 660 in your hymnals, hymn 660, and we'll sing together for our processional, Lift High the Cross. You may be seated. The scriptures testify that when we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, who formed us from the dust of the earth, who by your breath gave us life, we glorify you. Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, who suffered death for all humanity, who rose from the grave to open the way to eternal life, we praise you. Holy Spirit, 
author and giver of life, the comforter of all who sorrow, our sure confidence and everlasting hope, we worship you. To you, O blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be glory and honor forever and ever. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our brother, John Showalter. We thank you for giving him to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ so that we may live in confidence and hope until by your call we are gathered to our heavenly home in the company of all your saints. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. At this time, I do want to read uh, reflections uh, from the family. First of all, from Nancy, uh, on, according to John this day. A selfless man. My dear, dear husband, John Showalter, never put himself first. He was truly selfless. Ask his kids about what he wanted for Christmas or his birthday. I don't need anything. Yet he never bought anything for himself that wasn't farm related. His best Christmas gift came last year in the form of a day at the Field of Dreams where most of the family was there in 100 plus degree temps to have a hard fought game of baseball on the famous field. Tops on this year's Christmas list was some similar type of activity with the whole family. John was diagnosed with fibriotic, fibriotic chronic hypersensitive pneumonitis, which you can tell I'm not a doctor, or more easily understood as farmer's lung which was from inhaling hog dust, grain dust, et cetera, over as many years of farming. Mayo Clinic did everything they could, but it was a progressive degree, disease with no cure. As his last act of self, selflessness, he said to donate all of his body parts that he hadn't already worn out. Two people will regain sight due to the donation of his corneas. Yep. He used up all the rest. John was the same selfless guy every day of our marriage, always putting me first. That's what ended his life last Thursday morning. We had a somewhat complicated system of getting to and from the upstairs bedroom without being without oxygen for more than a moment. He chose to bypass that system because he didn't want to wake me up. He did not make it. That's who he was. John and I met 19 years ago when I was invited to dinner by Cindy and Merm in Omaha. I knew it was a matchmaking attempt, but I was hardened by many dates with many undesirables. I said, I would never move. I love my house. I love my job. And he, he's a farmer. After our first date, a few months later, I ate my words. What attracted me the most to John, besides his handsomeness and his beautiful blue eyes, was his love for his family. As my son, Matt, said, he's normal. From that point, we saw each other every weekend, and to the shock and worry of his sons, we married six months later. We were a great team. I cooked. He always cleaned up. Everyone knew you didn't mess with John's job. He had strict rules about how the dishes went into the dishwasher. Wives, or more importantly, husbands, listen up. I never had to pick up after him. Glad my wife isn't here to hear this. <laughs> All right. He never failed to bring me a bowl of ice cream if he was having one, an addiction we both admit. He was an incredible husband every day. 
We both love the vacation, traveling all around the country on road trips, going to China, Mexico, Alaska, and Hawaii. He was a wonderful traveling companion. Our last vacation quest was the sight unseen, the purchase of a 40-year-old mobile home in Mesa, Arizona. We were excited about spending a few winter months there with friends. John said he would retire from farming after one last good price year. I've heard that before. But the $4 corn never seemed to stop, and he gave up his gold. Not that he ever regretted his choice, but that subsequent $7 corn was a hard pill to swallow. Life has been tough on us the last three years. My bout with cancer, his leg injury, and then his trifecta, heart disease, diabetes, and lung disease. COVID was especially frustrating to us because we had to make sure he didn't get it. We missed holidays with family, athletic events, thanks heavens for streaming, and time with friends. But we never had a bad day because we had each other. I knew I would eventually face life without him, and it haunted me every day. After all, I was the one who was supposed to go first, and that would have been much easier on me. How would I ever get through the days after? How would I survive his visitation and funeral? I found out. It was with the help of all of you. I've been overwhelmed by the visits, the messages, the flowers, the Facebook posts, and the words, we will be here with you after everyone else leaves. And I know they, you, will. Thanks to all of you. This wasn't easy to write, but thank you so much. I think it says a lot about that. And also I have uh, uh, something I want to read from uh, John's sons, Matt, Brett, Quinn, and Drew. Our father loved to tell stories. Each one of us here has our own special story or memory with John. Some of us here have heard his story several times. Some of us have heard the same story <laughs> hundreds, lots of love. John enjoyed conversation. He also enjoyed his family. Everything he did in his life was for his family. He didn't want or need fancy clothes or brand new things to enjoy life. His sole mission in this world was to be able to provide a good life for his family. We may not have had everything we wanted, but if there was something we needed, we had it. He was humble and giving both with his time and acts as well as his money. He was an organ donor and was adamant that whatever could be used uh, from his body to go to someone who needed it, always thinking of others rather than himself. We all thought that John would live forever. He was strong and tough, hardworking, and when we put his mind to something, he accomplished the task. If things weren't going as planned, he worked even harder. No one worked longer or harder. In fact, one time he was in such a hurry that he pulled into the tire shop, used their tools to remove his own wheel and fixed his own tire, <laughs> just so he didn't have to wait. <laughs> in the last few years, John's body began to fail him. It was simply worn out. Like a bearing or chain, even properly maintained, they all have useful life and will eventually wear out. We didn't want to admit it because he was dad. He could wrestle a grizzly bear and come out victorious. All things considered, he kept a positive attitude and continued to tell us, I think I'm getting better. And we believed him. He had a good last day. He got his hair cut. He really enjoyed going to his barber. 
Normally, they played a hand of his cards for his haircut. If he won the hand, the haircut was free. If he lost, he paid double. <laughs> that day, the barber mentioned his brother was going through some tough times. So he gave him $50 instead of playing cards. He went to the chiropractor. He felt good. He spent the afternoon with his buddies playing cards. They played long enough. Nancy had to run him for an extra tank of oxygen so he could keep on playing. He told his best friend on the way home, I even made some money today, two dollars. <laughs> that evening he had a wonderful home cooked meal with more friends who came over to visit. They ended the night with homemade apple pie and he loved pie. He knew, he knew his time on earth was running out. In the last few months, he made it a point to make sure that all his things were in order and that once again his family would be okay after he was gone. He was always looking out and providing for his family. Thank you. Thank you, Dad, for being a good example. Thank you for all that you've done for me, my brothers, and our families. Thank you for loving us and supporting us. We love you, and we will greatly miss you. Thank you so much. This time, I want to call our attention to God's Word, and uh, the first word we're going to be looking at uh, today is printed inside your bulletins. It's a, a psalm, uh, Psalm 121. It is a, a psalm that is called the Psalm of Journeys, that is one journeys that we realize that we never go alone, that uh, uh, we can look up and know that God is with us, uh, and as we're going to hear in the last verse as we read together, God is with us in our coming in and our going out, not only now, but the word I want you to hear also forevermore. So together, let us read Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills, and from where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil, keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. The second reading I've chosen for this occasion is a reading from James chapter 5, where the brother of Jesus is talking about a farmer. And so hear this word from James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient over it until it receives the early and the late rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble, brothers and sisters, against one another, that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the doors. As an example of suffering and patience, take the prophets, who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we call those happy who are enduring and steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Here ends our first reading. The gospel reading I've chosen for today is from St. John chapter 15. Uh, verses 1 through 16. It ties into again to 
agriculture, anybody that's growing things knows that it needs to be rooted into the vine and connected in order that it might fulfill its purpose of being able to bear fruit. And so Jesus gives us this in John 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that bears no fruit, he takes away. But every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it might bear more fruit. You are already made clean by the word that I have spoken to you. So abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If a man does not abide in me, he's cast forth as a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As a father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant doesn't know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go forth and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. This I continue to command to you, love one another. This is the word of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. On January the 26th, 1951, a son was born to Helen and Kenneth Showalter here in Hampton. He was aptly named John, a biblical name that means God is gracious. In that gospel reading that I just concluded from John 15, we heard these words. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove and show others that you are my disciples. This church this morning is packed today because in the creative and loving twinkle of our gracious God, John was given life. And through John's faith and his life, my goodness, he bore much, much good fruit, displaying for all of us to see his honor for the Lord, his love and his care for his family, his devotion to this community, as well as his love for his farm and his neighbors and this church, St. Paul. I'm here as one who in a very seemingly small way, but yet I'm going to tell you large, was blessed by John and you, Nancy. On several occasions, it may surprise many of you to know, I was at John's home. I was at John's home because I was checking out our son's garden and enjoying the fruits and vegetables from Pastor Dan Hansen's garden of muskmelon, watermelon, cucumbers, potatoes, and especially those sweet potatoes. Now, I garden in Cedar Falls, Iowa, but that soil that I till is not as black and rich as that soil that's on John and Nancy's farm. And Dan's garden produced well. But way beyond all those delicious vegetables that we shared, there was the fruit of graciousness 
and generosity that John and Nancy showered upon our son, Pastor Dan and Amy. That garden in your home was a place away where Dan sometimes would get out of town and uh, get away and be able to do what he loved to do in gardening, but also visit with you and be blessed by a bond that I guarantee you, and I say that will be with him all the days of his life. And as his dad, I tell you, this means the world to me and you. And John means the world to Dan and Amy. Pastor Dan did come on Thursday to be with you, Nancy. And due to his new call and responsibilities at Trinity and Mason City, couldn't officiate. But I'm honored to be here today Providing, I pray, in my presence and preaching, maybe just a little bit of a sign of what you meant to our son as he shares your loss today in grief. But not only the loss and the grief, also that love that you had for your family and the hope that is John's and ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. At funeral services, I do believe it's very important to share memories and stories. An unknown rabbi centuries ago left this saying, God made men and women because God loves stories. Boy, John loves stories too. And our gracious God created and shaped the life of John. And God deemed John so precious and important. And John, and God most certainly used John to give you, every one of you, many, many stories. Now, I reviewed the stories on the page that was connected to his obituary. Uh, I'd like to read them all, but there's a lunch, and I want to make sure that you get there, all right? That's how many is on there. There's a lot on there. But I do want to pull a few out because I do think it does describe, I know your family did a great job and everything there too, but I think also beyond what John meant to this community here. The Bobst family, I don't know who they are, but that's okay. This is what they said. John was the type of man you built a community around. Wow. And I'm just going to put a sidebar. We need more men like that in our nation, in our communities, that you can build a community around and get along. He was a powerful example, will be missed by many, but his caring heart will be missed by most of us. John served 28 years as a school board member and president of the Hampton Dumont School District. And his dedication and service has helped to make Hampton Dumont a leading school in education and athletics. And John was also a 4 -er, living out through all of his life the pledge. I pledge my head to clear thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, my health to better living, for my club, my community, my country, and my world. Yeah, I was a 4-H'er too. <laughs> but whether it be in support of 4-H, FFA, the love of that land and farming, the DeKalb Seed Corn dealership and his customers, John did whatever he did, could do to build up this community where he lived virtually all the days of his life. Now, Mike Burrell shared these words. He remembered John as one who was tough and a fun-loving hombre. He said, I first knew him as a wrestling competitor. Now, I'm not sure that most of the people who competed against John on the wrestling mat would say, I have good memories of that, all right? <laughs> but this guy does, all right? Later on, Mike said, we became AGR fraternity brothers and friends. A lot of competitors remember John on the wrestling mat. He was tough. 
a two-time Iowa High School Wrestling State runner-up, and John attended, as you can tell, and I saw the flags waving as I came into town, Iowa State University Cyclones all over town, all right? Uh, as a part of his wrestling squad there at Iowa State for four years, joining a host of tough hombres there at Iowa State who knew how to compete and win despite injury and challenges. A number of those posting memories shared how John loved his sons, as well as all of his grandchildren, supporting them in the many, many activities that they had in band concerts, athletic contests, and with one of those little VCR cameras things. I, I do know what that is. That's in my time, all right? I do know that. And videotaping what they said, several thousand, that's a lot, wrestling matches in order that his own children, but also his own sons, but also all their friends could be able to see their wrestling matches and talk about it. I'm sure there's lots of stories and they're still being shown. And since 2004, you, Nancy, as you shared in your uh, little tribute, have traveled with John near and far, seeing uh, from sea to shining sea, virtually all the United States, as well as Mexico on that adventure trip to China. The journey you shared together helped create famous weekends at what you called the Hamptons. I kind of like that, all right? As you hosted family reunions, but also as you shared in your tribute to and in your memories, how you navigated many ups and downs, those hard days together, as you endured together through a number of health crises. John's lung issues did slow him down. But I don't think there's a single person here today that imagined that John would leave us like he did so soon. I know it's very hard for you as his beloved family, his church members here at St. Paul, his neighbors, his former customers, his friends, his Hampton community to imagine life here in this community and in your family without John's daily presence. John is gonna be missed. And I know and I can see in all of you that your hearts are hurting in grief. In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 413, there is a word of God that each and every one of us need to take to heart. That's this word from Paul. It says, we don't want you to be uninformed brothers and sisters about those who have died so that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. Trust me, in this nation and our world, unfortunately, there are many, many people who grieve because they don't have the hope of Christ. But this is different. As Paul writes, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again for us, even so, through Jesus Christ, God will bring with him and to him those who have died. The God who loved and blessed John sent him and us a Savior in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I have come to you that you might have life life to the fullest. He also declared, I have come that you might be rooted in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me and I in you, and you will bear much good fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. But connected to me, you'll endure. You'll have life now and forevermore. In the book of Revelation, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. He who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on the throne. 
It wasn't until just about a year ago. I have read this text hundreds of times. But it didn't really hit my mind until I realized when I heard this last thing. We not only get to gather at the throne of Jesus, we get to sit on the throne right next to Jesus in that life to come. For Jesus said, as I myself conquered and sat down with my Father on his throne, so those who believe in me will be with me. Well, we all know that Jesus came a-knocking at the door of John and grace and mercy. And John let him in. And we've been the recipients of John's faith and a life that has borne the abundant fruits of God. One of the images of eternal life that Jesus often used is the harvest. For John, born and raised on a farm, devoted with his sons to farming, leaving this earth at the end of the harvest season might seem to be quite appropriate. The soybeans and the corn had been combined. As I drove over here, I didn't see a single field that was still out, out there. The precious and abundant crops have been separated from the chaff, and they're safely stored in bins to be a blessing to countless others throughout the whole world. Well, John is now counted among those who are safely gathered in the Lord's harvest. And folks, this harvest is wonderful. John and all who believe will abide with Jesus forever. And we also hear the wonderful news. There's still room there for you, for me, for all who believe that when our time is over, God will find a place for us. It is this hope in Jesus and his promises that will be our light and our thanksgiving as we move on, as we endure in the journeys yet before us. Missing John, yes, but also abiding in Jesus. And like John, having the opportunities connected to the Lord to bear the good fruits, the good fruits that build up faith and families, neighborhoods, and communities. And to that, even on this hard day, we say, thanks be to God. Amen. I'd ask you now to turn inside your hymnals to hymn number 732 as a tribute that that gracious and loving Lord that uh, gave us life continues to journey with us through all of our life. We'll sing together Born and Cry. Again, that's number 732 in your red hymnals. If you find 
someone to share your time and you join your hearts as one I'll be there to make your verses run from dust till rising sun in the middle ages of your life not too old no longer young I'll be there to guide you through the night complete what I begun when the evening gently closes in and you shut your weary heart I'll be there as I have always been with just one more surprise I'd ask you now to turn to your insert uh, that is in your bulletin for today as we together, as the people of God, profess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we join together in prayer today, I will end each petition with the words, God of mercy, and I'd ask you to respond. Hear our prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit your chosen people together in one communion. In the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, Give to your whole church on heaven and on earth your light and your peace. God of mercy, grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and be raised to newness of life, and that through the grave and the gate of death we may pass with him to our joyful resurrection. God of mercy, grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage, who walk as yet by faith, that your Holy Spirit may lead us in holiness, love, and righteousness all our days. God of mercy, grant courage and faith to those who are bereaved, that they may have the strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a holy and certain hope, and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. God of mercy, grant us grace today to entrust John, to your never-failing love, which sustained him in this life. Receive him to the arms of your mercy and remember him according to the favor you bear for your people. God of mercy. God of all grace, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to bring life and immortality to light. We give you thanks because by his death, Jesus destroyed the power of death and by his resurrection, Jesus has opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come shall be able to separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. If you're able, I'd ask you to please stand now as we together pray the prayer that Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, John Edward Showalter. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You are invited immediately following this service to a reception that's going to be uh, served right here in the fellowship hall uh, here at St. Paul. And before that time, uh, again, I want to thank you on behalf of Nancy and all of John's family for being here today. Uh, what a community support and outreach, and uh, that is just a fantastic thing. And as, as we heard, you're going to be here a while because there's a lot of stories to tell. And they wanted story. That's a big part of this. And so just feel free to, that's a big part of it because that's a way in which I think John's legacy continues to live among us and lift us up. So let the stories go. But also, I've only eaten here a few times, but it's really good food. So uh, I would strongly suggest you be able to stay too. But I'd like to have a special prayer to bless that time. Dear Lord, we do thank you that uh, you are here. And we thank you, O oh Lord, that uh, you've moved us to be able to come together. Come together with heavy hearts, yes, but come together as a family and a community and a church that lives in hope. And we just pray, O oh Lord, that as we fully entrust John to your loving hands, in which we know that you will care for him, that, O oh Lord, as we step forward, we know that you'll be with us to care for us uh, in this roller coaster of life in which we live. And we just pray, O oh Lord, uh, and thank you for the sunshine of this day, uh, for the blessing of family and friends, for you, O oh Lord. And we just pray that this food that's been so lovingly prepared for us by the kitchen staff may, uh, O oh Lord, uh, uh, fill us and uh, that uh, we might be able to live in your peace and, uh, and also bear the good fruits that you've given us in our purpose in our life here on earth. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For our recessional hymn, I'd ask you to turn to your red hymnals to hymn number 779, and we'll sing together then Amazing Grace. Oh. 